This morning, I need to let you know that we just got back. Um, Britta, Chris, and I just got back from this amazing thing called the Orange Conference out in Atlanta, Georgia. And we just spent the last three days getting filled to the brim, to the place where we're overflowing with this idea of the thing called the Orange Strategy. Look to your neighbor and say, what's the Orange Strategy? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's the light of the church, yellow, and the love of the family, red, working together because two two influences together are greater when they work together. And so church and family working together to create something new, something different, something lasting, something sticky, something that changes children, young people, young adults, and eventually adults for the church. And it was powerful and it was amazing. And we came back just bubbling over. We still are. You just ask me or Chris or uh, Britta, and you'll hear these amazing, amazing stories. And Leon, Pastor Leon, this, the lead pastor here at Shepherd, he just got back from Israel with that group last night about 2 or 3 a.m. We haven't had confirmation that he made it back. We haven't, has anybody heard? Okay, we got good. We got, Dad knows. Dad knows. That's good. Um, and at some point, he said, no, Mike, I can preach this Sunday. And I laughed. <laughs> Yeah, you're coming in at three. Sure, you'll get that done. Um, so, uh, Leon, when you see this, I hope you're sleeping well. Um, there's a, so, the, we're, we're really thankful for the things that you do for our leadership. Church, you allow us to go and be fed in places and to go places and to lead you places. And we are so thankful that you make that possible. You make that a possibility for us. Because, again, you're dialed to generous and that we can do things that other churches are only dreaming about doing because of you, because of how you follow Jesus. So I just want to start right there with thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, There are a couple things that are coming up that you need to pay attention to. Um, Number one is we are still recruiting for our Mexico mission trip that's happening at the end of June. If you are interested in going to Mexico to build a home uh, for, some, for a family and have your life, ch- life changed in such positive ways, I want you to see Bill Brock over here. Bill, raise your hand and make some noise. The one time I ask you to make noise? Really? Come on. That's Bill Brock. Listen for the noise. Um, and uh, our married people has a Cinco de Mayo date night coming up. I think that's on the 5th of May, amazingly like that. How did May get here? How is it May? I, it's, 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 it's creeping me out. It's just moving so fast. Um, so this morning, uh, Beth has already touched on a little bit of the passage that we're going to talk about this morning. Um, it's Peter and Jesus on that beach, that breakfast beach. And you saw some cereal out there. So after services, um, we want you to have a little breakfast here at Shepherd. Have some cereal. See if you can see and get real with Jesus today. Oh. All right, all right. If you're going to moan... You better moan like you own it. Don't like, "Mm." okay, see if you can get real with Jesus. Uh, There we go. Good. See, I'll own the joke. You own the disinterest. That's fine. (laughs) All right. So do me this favor. We're going to read some scripture, so I'm going to ask that you stand as we read the New Testament reading. It comes from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 17. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the nets because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer, gar- outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the waters. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing a net full of fish, for they were not that far away from the shore, only about 100 yards. When they had landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some fish you have just caught. 
So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of fish, 153, but even with so many, it wasn't torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word. Be with us now as we encounter you and as we, we seek to respond and to, to live a life um, in response and gratitude to your love. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. This morning, I'm calling this little sermon um, unspoken. Everybody say that word with me, unspoken. I, I've heard and learned in life that there are many things that are unspoken, things that you just kind of People assume no one teaches you anything. It just happens. You kind of learn it. And if you don't learn it in time, well, you're a loser, right? And this is especially, it's true, it's true. I'm just being honest. This is especially for me, true for me in the digital world. Um, I'm trying to keep up with all the latest stuff like Snapmagram and Stumbler and Emohi, right? I'm, I'm pretty cool. I try to keep up with all that stuff. Um, and no matter what I try to do, I always end up breaking some unwritten um, digital, internet, googly rule about how we're supposed to interact with people online. There's some unspoken online rule book. So let me learn you a few things so we can all be up to snuff on this digital stuff because if you don't know, now you're going to know. Okay. Did you know that there are two types of hey when you text someone? Two types. Really, there are actually two different types of hey. For the longest time, I would send out texts to my kids and friends. I'd text, hey, H-E-Y. And um, I would rarely get any responses. But I would always get re responses from people back, and it would be H-E-Y-Y. -Y. Hey! And they're like, what's the deal? What's different? Why, why? I'm thinking their Y button is stuck on their phone. Because don't you know how to type? Don't you know how to spell? Phones don't even have buttons anymore. <laughs> Here's the difference. Hey, in the modern language, in modern text language, is like, hey, we need to talk. Right, so, hey, oh, it's, hey, I, I want to invite you to something. Like, oh, that got serious fast. You threw a hey in there. But hey is like, hey, what's up, my sister from a different mister? My brother from another mother. Come on. So you get a different engagement with hey versus hey. And so I'm learning. I'm learning there's rules. There's also rules like how many times can you send someone a text message when they don't respond? How many times should you spend, send a message? Well, I didn't know there was a rule about that. I thought, hey, it's just a way to reach someone right in their pocket. So you send them one, two, three, 15, 27, and you just start spamming them. You start spelling words one letter at a time. Bing, 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 bing. The rule is two. <laughs> it's an unspoken rule. Because after two, if you're still sending messages, you're just hashtag super needy, right? That's, that's how it is. Are you anybody guilty of sending more than two without a response? Come on, be honest. Put them up there, moms, dads. Okay, okay. Sometimes you make every sentence a different text, and it could be, okay, it's, uh, we just need to stop. We need to stop. I'm learning you things, people. I'm learning this is all true. It's all true. Um, I also learned that while I'm traveling, there are unspoken rules on airplanes. Um, so when you're going through security, and you've taken off your shoes, and you got your bag on there, it goes through the x-ray, right when it comes out of the x-ray, right when it comes out of the x-ray, is not the time to grab your belt and start putting your belt on, start putting your shoes on. You just need to grab your stuff and get off that conveyor belt, okay? Because the 20 steps it's going to take for you to put on those penny loafers and uh, your belt, that's my time. My stuff is stuck 
Well, your stuff is just piled up right at the x-ray, so don't do that. You want to know how I learned that? I experienced that today, or actually a couple days ago. It's like the guy just stopped right there in the whole line, just like, really? You're going to do everything right there? Unspoken rules, unspoken rules. Professional flyers know exactly how to do it. If you're a professional flyer, just raise your hand. You've flown so much. You know exactly how to make this work. Um, there's another um, rule. It's uh, the seat space on your airplane. Okay. Now, I'm a big guy, right? I'm 6'2". Um, I don't want to say any numbers, but I'm a bigger number than... Uh, I'm a big guy. And so that armrest is important because it, it defines my space, defines my space, right? But I know that if I can, I, I'll want that armrest up because it's a little more comfortable if I can have that armrest up. And so we're on the flight um, back from Georgia to, to Austin, and this guy that comes walking down the aisle, he's a big guy like me too, but he's like five or six inches taller than me. He, he's, he sits down, and I'm like, hi. <laughs> and I had the armrest down because, again, I'm defending my space. I got 50% of armrest. That's my space. That's, the armrest is Switzerland, people, right? This is where we share. And he, go, he looks down, and this is a big guy. He goes, oh, no, that armrest has got to go. Okay. <laughs> and he sits down, and I kid you not, from ankle to armpit, we were connected the entire flight. I'm social, but I'm not quite that social. And he looked over at me, and it was like when you look, when you're that close, it's like faces that are too close. He goes, I'm not feeling well. I'm like, oh. <laughs> That's got to be an unspoken rule, too. You don't tell anybody that. You just, get out, you just go to the bathroom. I actually had to hand him an air sickness bag, and I said to myself, there's no way that bag is going to be big enough. <laughs> it's just it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Okay, and, and the last airplane rule is like, just because the plane stops does not mean you're supposed to get up, all right? It's not like you're Usain Bolt and you're going to make a, a record run outside of the airplane. You're row 36. You're going to be sitting there for a while, so just relax. And this is an important one for my, my young men, um, all, the, all the men here in the, the church. If you have a best man when you're getting ready to get married, and they tell you, you should, with vigor, take that piece of cake that you're supposed to feed to your spouse, if they tell you that you're supposed to smash it, don't do it. <laughs> it's unwritten. It's an unspoken rule. It's unspoken. No one tells you that you shouldn't. It's like, oh, it's part of the traditions. Um, I have a wife that's looking at me right now going, hmm, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, you just, it's just, it's unspoken. And there are so many things in our life that are unspoken. Um, you may get into a, a heated argument, I mean, a, a loud, boisterous conversation with your significant other, and... Um, and in the context of that conversation, that really loud conversation, um, words slipped out of your mouth that you wish you hadn't said. You wanted to take them back, but bleh, they're out there, and you're trying to grab them, but they're gone. And you saw that they hurt, or they saw that they damaged the relationship. And right away, you want to apologize for saying those words, but you can't because you're too busy dodging random objects that are being thrown at you now, right? It's, you said something, and it hurt someone. You did something, and it broke something. And when you have that opportunity to fix it, sometimes you don't for reasons like pride or fear uh, uh, or, or just that you hurt. You still want to apologize, but every time you try, something seems to go, go wrong. The phone rings, the dog barks, bad moods, other fights ensue. Um, and it's like the chance to fix what was unspoken, it seems to get further and further away. Anybody feel that? Am I all by myself on that? Please let me know. Are you with me? Okay, I'm just making sure. And even though you already know the words, even though your hearts already own them, even though all the things that are in place, the words never come out. They remain unspoken. And those unspoken words, church, can be so destructive to yourself. So we all have those times where we wish we said something, but we didn't. 
And then afterwards, we felt like now we can't say it. It feels as if too much time has gone by. We all know that sometimes when we talk to a friend or significant other that, that we want to tell them, we rehearse telling them, we prep telling them. Sometimes I feel like I'm a, I'm a seventh grade boy getting ready to call a girl for the first time. I got the phone, I pick it up, I dial the number. That's a lot of numbers. Okay, and, and you're just waiting. Bring, bring, bring. And you just want to say, I like you. Those are the only words that you want to come out of your mouth. And they pick up and they go, hello. And you go, you're stupid. Ah! And you don't know what to do because you, you panicked. You couldn't say the thing that you needed to say, even though you rehearsed it. And the thing that you wanted to say is, I like you or I care about you. And it doesn't come out. We get stuck in this unspoken place. Sometimes when we want to repair a relationship, that unspoken place, um, we're afraid that if we go back to it, it's going to be like reliving that painful moment all over again. It's as if we're afraid if we start to bring it up, that the person's going to take those words as we begin to, to recognize what we need to say, and they're going to twist them into ninja stars and throw them right back at us, and it's just going to be this horrible experience all over again. Unspoken is a dangerous, dangerous place. I think we all carry a lot of unspoken with our friends, with our family, and even with God. At home, at work, with friends, with your kids, and in your faith, there are things that need to be said. Some in the quiet of prayer and some face to face with the people that you love. In our passage, we see post-resurrection Jesus showing up for the third time in about three weeks. And he shows up to seven of the, the disciples, and they were fishing. Uh, and after helping them find fish again, um, he invites them to join him for breakfast. He says, come have breakfast. As I read this whole section, that whole section about Peter and the, the fishing, I realize that this is something that Jesus constructed just for Peter. There are so many unspoken things that are happening in this passage. There's no way that they're all coincidence. It's as, G, as, it's as if Jesus is painting a picture of unspoken events and words for Peter to, to absorb, to lead him to that conversation that he has at the end. See, when, Peter, when Jesus shows up the first time in the upper room, can you imagine how Peter felt? I don't think he could even look at him. Because the last time he saw Jesus was he had just denied him for the third time. He was by the fire of coals, and he looks over, and they lock eyes. And he says, I don't know the man. And that image is burned into his heart and his head. And so when Jesus pops into the upper room, the locked upper room, and he says, peace be with you, Peter's like, oh, no. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. Because the last thing I did, the last thing I did. And so P Jesus is there for a little while, and then poof, he's gone again. Next week, I'm sure in that time, Jesus, I mean, Peter's getting ready. He's like, when Jesus comes back, I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him everything. I'm going to say all those words. He's rehearsed it. He's gotten it already. Jesus, I'm so sorry. Jesus, I'm so sorry. You know I love you. Jesus, I'm so sorry. And Jesus shows up. Peace be with you. Let's talk to Thomas. <laughs> and Peter was ready, but Jesus didn't even look at him. Thomas doesn't even play a big part in the story. Peter's the one that's in the story all the time, and he's talking to Thomas. Three weeks go by, unspoken. Oh, my gosh. The weight that must have been on him. Did Jesus still love him? After what he had done, could Jesus still care for him after what he had said? So those two previous visits just tore him up even more. Some scholars say that because of all this that's going on, Peter had lost hope, that he had lost faith and he was walking away. That's why he went fishing. He went back to what he used to know. He went back to what he was comfortable with. But maybe, just maybe, he was going back to a place where he could process, where he could think, a place that was familiar. So Jesus creates this amazing encounter for Peter. Listen to all the things that happen that you may not have heard as we read. In the catching of the fish, 
That's the first place that Jesus met Peter, is on a boat. When he couldn't catch fish, he said, catch it on the other side. Peter would have remembered that. Oh my gosh, we've done this before. I've seen this miracle before. When, when John says, it's the Lord, and Peter goes, it's the Lord? And he jumps out of the boat. Well, the first time Peter jumps out of the boat, what happens? He walks on the water. And then he gets wet. Second time, I think he gathered up all his stuff. He says, I'm going to walk on the water and go, bloop, and gets wet. Straight in. Jesus is cooking fish and loaves. Where else is that in Scripture? In the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus, Peter remembers that. He literally breaks bread with them, just like the Passover. And so he's remembering the Last Supper, and he's remembering that moment where he says, I will never betray you. And lastly, they're gathered around a coal fire just like the one that Peter was next to when he said those words, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. These stories that Jesus paints, this picture that he sets up, it tells the story of Peter from Peter's call to Peter's fall. And I think for many of us, this is where we believe our story ends. We know that Jesus loved us. We said yes and we followed. We put our hearts in gear. We engaged and then we, and you just fill in the blank. Whatever you did that was so bad, whatever you did that was so wrong, whatever you hurt, whatever you broke, whatever relationship that didn't work, whatever, 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 that's your fall and that's where you're stuck. The first thing I want you to take away from this passage is that Jesus didn't come to that beach to condemn Peter. He came and he invited him to breakfast. He came and he invited him to breakfast. And that's really why the cereal's there. Because there's things that we need to do around food. We need to gather and eat and share and be together and be real to, with one another. We need to say the unspoken things that, that need to be said to and with one another. See, w- while they were sitting there, Jesus eats with them. He, he laughs with them. Uh, he shares with them. He preps food for them. He loves them. Jesus shows up, and he's obviously for them. And while he's there, because I've always seen this scene as Jesus taking Peter's hand and saying, come walk along the beach with me. Right? It's like the footprints in the sand image. But as I read it for this service, they're gathered around the fire. All the disciples are right there. Peter's sitting right next to Jesus. He still hasn't said anything. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And all Peter could hear was the lie that he'd been telling himself for weeks. The lie was that his sin of denial was somehow great enough and powerful enough to overwhelm and disqualify him from the grace of God through Jesus. Let me say that again. He believed that his sin of denying Jesus was somehow great enough that it could remove him from the grace of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to Peter, he loves him. And Peter's saying, my denial keeps you from loving me. That's the lie. That's the lie. And that's the lie that a lot of us in this room believe and a lot of us outside of this room believe, that our denial keeps us from the love of Jesus Christ. And see, when Jesus talks to Peter, he doesn't do it in a way that that we even fully understand because when Jesus says to Peter, do you love me, he doesn't do it in an accusing tone. It's not like, do you love me? He doesn't do it with judgmental scowl. Do you even love me? But he says it with the voice of an advocate. He says, do you love me? Jesus was for Peter. He knew that Peter loved him. He just needed Peter to recognize that Peter loved him. Let me say that again. He knew that Peter loved him. He just needed Peter to recognize that he loved him. So, church, here's what I want you to hear. That if you believe your sins are too 
big that Jesus can't forgive them. You need to get a bitter, bigger picture of Jesus because he can forgive you. He can redeem you. That sin and our brokenness, that disobedience that leads us so far away tells us that there's no way that God could reach out is a lie. Christ's love for you overcomes your disobedience. Christ's love for you reaches into the darkness and into the hole and into the place that you hide yourself and says, come have breakfast with me. And if you're not sure about that, look at Peter. His unspoken words that Jesus spoke into his heart remind us that, that Jesus was enough to give even Peter a new starting point, a new place, a new perspective, a new relationship, a new hope, and a new promise. If Peter the denier can be reconciled to Jesus Christ, I want you to know that anybody can. And I want you to answer these same three questions that Jesus asked Peter. Church, do you love them? I really want you to answer this. Uh, this, this, is, can't be a, this can't be a, just a, a semi-participatory, I can't even get the words out right now. Church, do you love him? Yes. Church, do you love him? Yes. Church, do you love him? Yes. We often think that our past condemns our future, but what Jesus does is he redeems our past and promises us a future. Your sins and failures can never, can never eclipse the grace of God. You are defined not by your brokenness, but by the grace, love, mercy, and truth that Jesus gives us all. He took Peter from regret to restoration, from exclusion to embrace, from fallen to found, from deniable to undeniable grace. Come on, church, this is the good news. His love does not condemn us. His love restores us. Say that with me. His love does not condemn us. His love restores us. One more time. His love does not condemn us. His love restores us. Pray with me. Holy and gracious God, we thank you so much that you have met us in our brokenness. You have met us even when we can't say the words. And Lord, you have shown us that you love us, that you're for us, that you advocate with us. God, we thank you, and we just want to follow you a little bit better today. We want to trust you a little bit more. Father, there's those places in our hearts where we're, we're just holding on, and we're saying, you can't. You, don't. Don't go to those places. Don't open that door. Don't touch that. Father, we know that you love us. So this morning, we're inviting you to those places. Because you know that you're not condemning us, but you're coming to, to be with us, to, to have breakfast with us, to let us know of your love. We pray all these things with the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven,